bringing together voices in child and youth health care. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute, the Children's Hospital Foundation of Manitoba, the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, the Holland Bloorview Children's Rehabilitation Hospital Foundation, and the Children's Hospital Foundation of Saskatchewan. We would also like to thank the following Keystone and program partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. If you have any questions or comments for our panelists, please type them into the question box at any time during the presentation. You can also share your thoughts and questions on Twitter by tagging at CAFC Tweets and using the hashtag CAFC Presents. All of our webinars are recorded and can be found on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. Use the CAN to share these recordings with your colleagues or register an account and post comments, links, or other resources that you think will be of interest. And be sure to sign up for the CAFC Presents weekly email newsletter to stay up to date with upcoming webinars and our recorded webinar archive. Hello and welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. I'm Lisa Stromquist, the National Coordinator of Quality and Patient Safety here at the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centres. Today we welcome Carol Kaler to present Bringing the F Words to Life in a Therapeutic Recreation and Wellness Program, the Life, Leisure and Fun Environments Program at the Rehabilitation Centre for Children in Winnipeg. It provides therapeutic recreation programs using a family-centred developmental approach. Carol has worked in a variety of settings over the past 25 years with a primary focus on pediatrics. She has a functional, family-centered, and community-based approach. Carol has been working in the LIFE program at the Rehabilitation Center for Children in Winnipeg since the first therapeutic recreation programs were launched in 2008. So it's my pleasure now to pass a virtual podium over to Carol in Winnipeg. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, pleased to be able to present this information on this uh, platform today. Um, the LIFE program got going in uh, 2008 at the Rehabilitation Center for Children and we have enjoyed exponential growth since that time uh, thanks to the Children's Rehabilitation Foundation and their funding partners. Um, we had a startup grant from the RBC foundation and then things have just snowballed from there. Um, so I'm going to be uh, going through a number of things today, uh, concentrating on our philosophy, um, talking a little bit about the equipment that we have and use, the programs that we run, uh, what is the value for the kids, youth, families and staff. Um, some challenges that we've encountered and where do we want to go from here. So I'm going to start with philosophy. Um, we provide recreation wellness programming and equipment for children, youth and families funded as I said by our foundation. There's three components, uh, active living which is an equipment loan pool uh, summer day camps for kids age 12 to 21, and then our RBC Therapeutic Recreation Wellness Program, which is uh, programming that happens um, during the school year. So our philosophy is about uh, meaning, meaning, adding meaning to life, and doing it in within the. Uh, framework of guided participation which has its roots way back with uh, Vygotsky who is a Soviet psychologist um, born in 1896, uh, died in 1934 and his socio-cultural theory of human learning uh, and essentially that learning happens within the context of relationships. Uh, so recreation purpose uh, not to kill time but to make life not to stay occupied but to stay refreshed, not to offer an escape from life but to provide discovery of life. 
And how do we do that? Um, the efforts really uh, are a fantastic uh, tie-in for us um, because this is how we look at things. Outside of relationships, there is not a lot of meaning that happens in, in anybody's life. And so that is number one for us, that uh, family relationships and relationships with friends is where you do the best learning and where you um, develop motivation for participating in things and um, developing skills. And guided participation, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, leads to uh, functional gains, opportunities for fitness, fun, and of course all of this uh, feeds into future. Oh, and I'd just like to add, um, I would welcome questions uh, along the way. I prefer questions uh, as we go rather than saving them for the end, so please type them in as you uh, have questions or comments to share. So guided participation, uh, and here's a quote from Dr. Barbara Rogoff who um, continued work on Vygotsky's theory, and she uh, published this in 1990. Uh, children's cognitive development is an apprenticeship. Uh, it occurs through guided participation and social activity with companions who support and stretch children's understanding of and skills in using the tools of the culture. And supporting and stretching is really what we do. Um, we look at what is, what can a child do independently and we're not just talking about things they can do but um, where they're at socially, how are they participating, um, are they able to look around and pick up social cues? Uh, we look at where they're at, and then what could they do with a little bit of support from an adult? Um, and then we set up situations for them to step into that uh, extra zone, uh, which Dr. Rogoff and Vygotsky called the zone of proximal development, uh, that with a little bit of support you can do more than if you're on your own. And then gain competence and um, motivation to carry on. So we set up programs to facilitate independent thinking and decision making. So we'll set it up and then we will wait and offer an opportunity for the participant to do their own thinking, make their own decision to get involved. And as we know, making your own decisions uh, means that your motivation to carry on and motivation to learn more um, is strengthened, your motivation is intrinsic, you're doing it for yourself, um, because it feels good. You're not doing it to make somebody else happy. And so caring relationships is at the root of this and we work extensively with our staff to work on emotional connections, um, which carries through to the family and um, the families picking up their kids from camp or other programs can see that their children and teenagers are genuinely loved and cared for. And uh, this naturally feeds really well into kids wanting to come back and being motivated and, and having a good time. Um, we work hard at providing an atmosphere of, of safety from an emotional standpoint. Uh, we don't force anybody to do anything, rather that we provide opportunities and we provide uh, invitations. And again, this has a big impact on families. Uh, families know that their kids are safe, uh, that they're having fun, they're having opportunities to move and be fit, opportunities to make friends, opportunities to learn skills. Uh, 
So one of the ways that we do this is that we put our focus on the process rather than the product. So in this picture, uh, this uh, young boy with autism is working with his buddy on making a tie-dye shirt. And the tie-dye shirt itself, of course, is a great thing to have. Um, but the memories that this boy will carry with him about the process of getting it ready, choosing the colors, laughing about little things that happened, that is what will stay with him as he looks at the shirt. Um, and all of those memories are kind of tied up in there. We, we have a very strong uh, philosophy of I can. And so if there is something that is out of reach, for one of our participants, we then figure out how do we bring it within reach. And as we know, uh, swimming means different things for different people. And so swimming for an able-bodied adult might mean swimming laps. Swimming for uh, somebody with severe disabilities might mean, as the little girl in this picture, getting her into an adapted wetsuit so that she can stay warm first of all in the pool and then finding the right flotation so that she can be independent in the pool and uh, doesn't have have to have somebody um, providing support to her. And then on the left, a uh, little guy uh, riding an adapted bike and I love the look of concentration and discovery and happiness on his face he has to work really, really hard uh, to ride a bike, but it matters to him and he likes it. And we were able to um, pair him up with the right piece of equipment. So family and caregiver education and training is central to what we do. Um, because as therapists and as program providers, we are with these kids for a very short period of time. Uh, parents are with them for many, many years on a day-to-day -day basis, and caregivers are also there um, to uh, provide stuff when the professionals are not around. And this is actually an area that we're looking at expanding in our program uh, to, to share the tools and expand um, so that uh, kids can experience uh, safety emotionally and opportunities for growth um, in a wide variety of settings. I'm just wondering if there's any questions up to this point. Uh, no, so far there are no uh, questions. I'll just remind everybody that you can uh, type your questions or comments into the question pane uh, just as you think of them. That way uh, they're all keyed up for um, for uh, our panelists. So you can go continue on. All right, so I'm going to move on to uh, some of the equipment that we use. Um, I don't have uh, all of our equipment on slides because our equipment pool is quite extensive. And again, I have to give a shout out to our um, funding agency, the uh, Children's Rehabilitation Foundation, who tirelessly works to supply us with very high quality and fantastic equipment to work with. Um, so the uh, the handout that's available for you to download uh, has fairly detailed information on the adapted and specialized equipment that we use. And I'd encourage you to um, refer to that. Uh, there are websites included for you to get more information. And uh, I'm just going to share some of the favorites that we use in our program. So our equipment loan program is available for uh, short-term use for families, therapists, and schools. Uh, people can borrow equipment for three-week periods and um, if there's nobody waiting for that particular piece, they can extend their loan. And uh, so on this page, there are a couple of uh, favorites. 
um, I'm always looking for things that are affordable um, with the least amount of support. Um, you know, what can a kid manage with? We don't always have to go to the kind of luxury Cadillac model of bikes. And so the bike at the top is made by Trailmate. Uh, it's called the Trailmate Lowrider. Um, retails for about a thousand dollars and it has been a really fantastic find especially for our more aggressive um, adolescent and teen riders and there's two sizes so you can go anywhere from uh, you know a seven eight year old right up to a full adult size um, so these are uh, harder to tip, they're more stable, and we're currently working with a bike shop to figure out how to uh, slow it down um, to a fast adult walking pace for those kids who uh, don't have the judgment to ride on their own. And then at the bottom is a tandem that's made by uh, Belize uh, called the Twin Tri Rider. Uh, again, about a thousand dollars. A fairly affordable tandem trike uh, for a kid who just needs extra support. And then the bike on the left is uh, one of our uh, more expensive items. It's made by Freedom Concepts and it's a balanced bike so it tips over slowly. Um, we have had really great success uh, for kids learning to ride a two-wheeler using this, some uh, in as short as four or five days uh, have been able to transition over to a two-wheeler. Um, and for kids who lack judgment to safely ride a two-wheeler in the community, what uh, learning to ride a two-wheeler has enabled them to do is then move to riding a two-wheel tandem with a parent, um, which is easier to access, takes up less space, um, is much less expensive than purchasing a three-wheel tandem. And so here is a picture of one of our campers with a camp staff riding a two-wheel tandem. Um, and so the training and two-wheeling, not necessarily to get them to ride independently, but to uh, bring this kind of thing into the realm of possibility for uh, active and inclusive family fitness activity. Uh, the little green and yellow bike uh, is an example of adaptations that are made in our own mechanical design department. Uh, they will add large, sturdy balance wheels, a parent handle, a seatbelt if needed, pelvic support, um, and then foot pods with straps. They can also uh, convert any bike to become a direct drive so that any time the bike moves, the pedals move as well for kids who need um, help to learn that motor plan of, of pedaling. And then at the bottom um, is a little trailer bike uh, called the WeHoo. And these, again, are quite affordable. They're about $400. And they fit a child's average size, four to eight-year-olds. And these are really great for uh, little ones who have a fairly decent sense of midline. The bike won't tip, uh, but it will lean. And this is attached to an, uh, an adult bike. And so again, you can get out there um, and cycle in the community knowing that your, your child is safe. Uh, they can pedal or not pedal, a uh, fairly supportive seat with a um, lap and shoulder straps. Beach and snow mobility. This is Winnipeg. We get lots of both. And uh, so the beach chair shown on the left um, costs about $2,000. And it's great. It, uh, and people actually have used this in the winter as well because it's easy to roll over snow. 
uh, ice, gravel, sand, and in the summertime you can wheel it right into the lake and it floats. Um, the uh, orange flotation armrests uh, provide flotation and the armrests and the wheels pop off. They fit into a big hockey bag. The rest of it folds down and so it's fairly easy to transport. Uh, we've had families borrow this for their hot holidays in Florida uh, and it, it works really well. Uh, we have had, we have two of these in our equipment loan pool. One has been modified in our mechanical design department to provide a little more support for kids who need more lateral support in it. And then on the right uh, is a sample of our um, wooden push sleds. And these are handmade by a man in northern Manitoba uh, who adapted it from the dog sleds that are used. Uh, these are absolutely fantastic, really great built sleds. We have some that have been around for 20 or 25 years, have been repaired a few times, and they stand up really well. And these as well uh, fold down um, so that they're fairly easy to transport. And with the slats, it's easy to add seat belts and padding. Um, they're super easy to push on various types of snow as well as ice. Uh, these have been used by schools in their skating programs, outdoor recess, transportation in the winter, that sort of thing. And uh, he builds these on request. Now this is a serious favorite of mine, the um, adapted wetsuits. And these were actually designed by uh, Louise Kublik when she worked in aquatics at uh, Holland Blurview. Um, so they open right up. The shoulders have zippers, the uh, front zips, the pants open right up. And so for kids with really low tone or very high tone, you can lay them down on top of the garment and then zip it up around them. And these wetsuits allow kids to stay warm and stay in the water a lot longer. And actually just this past weekend, we had a family swimming event and um, one of the little girls who borrowed a wetsuit from us, uh, mom reported to me that she was able to stay in 30 minutes longer because she was in the wetsuit. And uh, so this is a, a really great product. Um, currently, they're available to order in the small and medium sizes. Um, we're working with a, a new manufacturer and are hoping that the other sizes will be available soon. The wet vests, the blue and black, um, are actually a product that uh, they were designed for able-bodied uh, deep water aqua size. Um, I really like them because they provide flotation without bulk. And so if you have kids who are um, ready to start developing some swimming skills, uh, but a life jacket is too bulky and frankly life jackets aren't designed to swim in anyway. Um, this provides uh, flotation without bulk and a little more independence and they're available in a number of sizes. Um, the uh, This garment here uh, is made by a company called Gabby and uh, swim diapers essentially in all sizes. Uh, they're washable, reusable, um, and contain solid waste matter. So for people who don't uh, have bowel control, uh, it's a way for them to continue to be in the pool. Uh, they're not expensive, about $20. And then this bottom, uh, you already saw a picture of this uh, happy girl in the pool. And the flotation device she's in is a new addition to our equipment pool. Uh, made by Thera Aquatics, a company in Australia, and it's basically filled with styrofoam beads. And they've designed a very nice, um, what they call a CP float. Uh, 
that, as you can see, has a very high uh, neck support. And this is the first device we found that will support a child with poor head control uh, in the water where the attendant can truly be hands-free and the uh, child or teenager is independent. So we really, really like this piece. Uh, and then last, um, we do a lot of cooking in our uh, programs that run during the school year. So I've included a few safety tools here. Um, the gloves you can buy at any kind of restaurant um, supply store. They're just cut resistant gloves and these have uh, made our lives much easier. Um, and one of the most predictable times that we use them is for shredding cheese. Uh, I have yet to meet somebody who has never kind of gotten their knuckles involved when they're shredding cheese, and so this uh, makes it possible for all of us to safely shred cheese, um, cut slippery items, um, that sort of thing. And then the uh, this holding device is made by Pampered Chef. It's called a hold and slice. A really great way to uh, hold your food for slicing, keep your fingers well out of the way so that you're not close to the knife. And then this last is a Parsons product. Um, it's a cutting board that has a knife attached to it. Uh, the cutting board has suction cups, so uh, it's firmly attached to the counter. And then the, the knife is attached so that uh, it's just a swivel motion. And again, some more safety for hands. This boy, as you can see, uh, he is learning to hold food with his other hand and be mindful of the distance between his hand and the knife. Uh, so just uh, transitioning now to programming. Any comments or questions so far? Actually, Carol, we have a, a number of questions. Uh, okay. We have a number of questions that have come in, so I will. Uh, I'll just uh, start at the top here. So it says, uh, Kate says, it sounds like you offer some fabulous programs. Uh, so how many certified therapeutic recreational uh, specialists and recreation therapy associates or assistants are involved? Okay, that's a great question. Um, Recreation therapy, as I'm sure you know, is not a licensed, um, oh, I should back up. Uh, physiotherapy and occupational therapy uh, is licensed and you're not allowed to use the term unless you have um, specific training, etc. cetera. And rec recreation therapy is um, still moving in that direction. So the staffing that we have, um, I'm the coordinator of the programs and my uh, initial training is in physiotherapy, so I'm a physiotherapist. And um, then I also went on to become certified in relationship development intervention, um, which was, uh, it's an intervention approach for kids with autism and developmental delay and uh, it's essentially a program that um, provides some structure for the guided participation model. And so I'm the coordinator of the program um, and then we have uh, two occupational therapists who work with us. Um, and then the other staff in the summertime, we uh, we have the luxury of having one-to-one -one staff for our summer day camps, and those staff, uh, many of them are uh, university students. We have uh, some professionals that come and join us in the summer, um, and they receive training in guided participation in the, the six weeks of summer camp is essentially um, an intensive training program for them. And then for our uh, programs that run during the school year, 
those people who've been through that six-week uh, training uh, work with us as recreation support workers on a one-to-three model. Great. So it's kind of a very long answer to a basic question. <laughs> There's never any simple answers. No. So I have a couple of questions that are related uh, to uh, the equipment. So mm -hmm. uh, Kendra's asking, are you aware of any bike attachments for wheelchair users, such as an arm bike attachment to propel a wheelchair for an individual with paraplegia? You know, I have seen those. Um, I've been curious about them. Uh, we have never purchased any. Uh, so, if anyone else out there has had some good experience with that kind of stuff, I would love to hear about it. Okay. And I really like, I like the, um, the Invacare hand cycle, I like a lot. And because it's designed by Invacare, um, the back is really like a wheelchair and it's a really nicely designed bike. Um, and uh, Kate has a, a comment as well. Um, walking handbrakes are wonderful modifications for parents and caregivers who accompany kids on adapted uh, bikes. And she says that most bike shops can easily modify a bike to have this. So that's uh, a good yes. tip. Yeah. Yeah. And we actually get, um, we have an adult support handle added by our mechanical design. And then uh, we can have. Uh, the brakes either only on the adult support handle or the bike shops can also provide a, a split brake so that both the uh, the client and the parent have access to the handbrake. Great. And somebody's asking, have you looked into purchasing a hippo camp for beach or all-terrain? You know, I have. Um, they are very, very expensive. I've also had trouble figuring out where to get them in Canada. So uh, if somebody has information about that, can you please email it to me? I would really appreciate that because I, I know it's a beautiful product. Great. Um, there's a question sort of related to the, the first one. Um, uh, Kendra's asking, how come there are no recreation therapists working on a full-time basis? Well, and I'll go back to the recreation therapy, um, essentially uh, myself and the OTs in the program are working in a recreation therapy capacity. Uh, the training available in Manitoba right now for rec therapists um, only focuses on uh, the geriatric population and uh, so we have been employing OT and physio people in that capacity. Okay. Uh, and there was a, a comment here uh, saying, Arm Bike Canada offers arm attachments to any manual wheelchair. They cost $2,000 and the owner lives in Steinbeck. Steinbeck, Manitoba? <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to, hey. Yes. Yes. Um, that's uh, from Kendra. And uh, she's also looking for the name of the company um, who sells the pool briefs. Okay, that's in the handout. I thought those were all in the handout. So if people would like to, in their control panel, you can um, download the handouts that. Uh, are in the right hand side in your control panel. And they'll also be um, posted on our uh, Knowledge Exchange Network following the uh, presentation. So maybe we'll just get back and you, uh, to your uh, presentation and we'll take more questions. Okay. All right, so I'll uh, just now talk about the um, adapted recreation programming that we offer. Um, there are summer day camps uh, for youth age 12 to 21. Um, we do take, we have a limited number of spots for uh, younger kids if their physical and medical needs are quite complex. Uh, but most of the time, uh, community programs 
because younger kids, um, their play is still relatively concrete, uh, they will still really enjoy something like a, a zoo camp if they have an attendant to help them. Um, as kids enter adolescence, uh, play becomes more sophisticated and there's a lot more um, unwritten social rules to play and that's when the gap gets much larger and so that's where the majority of our uh, funding for camps lies. So that's in the summer and then during the school year, September to June, we have a number of programs running through our the RBC Therapeutic Recreation Wellness Program. Uh, so the summer day camps are supervised by OT and physio. We have a one-to-one -one staff ratio uh, as well as a five-member um, resource team that includes OT and physio and then uh, three senior staff. And this is just a graph that uh, shows you what has happened in our summer day camp program from the early 1990s when there were two campers, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Um, and then by the end of the 1990s, uh, had moved up to 12 campers. Uh, 24 by 2000, uh, 2008 we added, um, so the orange camp was called Switched On as Computer and Switch Access Camp for kids with significant physical disabilities and then the purple camp, Jump and Ride, was a more active camp for uh, less involved, less physically involved kids. Um, so that continued to grow. And then in 2011, we decided to uh, combine the switch and computer camp with the more active camp, uh, and it also got quite a bit bigger, and we added a rural camp. Uh, 2012 continued to grow, 2013. And then in 2014, the two rural communities that we had run camps in uh, had their own things running, which is fantastic. Uh, and so we no longer had a role there. And so the green bar you see at the bottom there is another camp that we added that is community-based. And so for kids who can handle uh, dynamic changing environments, um, they meet at a different place every day and so they might spend a day at the zoo, a day at the water park, a day at the fringe festival, that sort of thing. Uh, so we expanded that in 2015 and then you see what happened this past summer. So over the last 26 years, we've gone from two campers to 122. Uh, and it, it's just been fantastic to be uh, part of that growth. So what do we do at camp? Uh, all the regular camp stuff, biking, bowling, art, yoga, music, outing, swimming, um, who comes to camp. Um, it's been an interesting uh, transition since the early 90s and really up to 2008. The focus was on uh, kids and teenagers with significant physical and cognitive disabilities. Um, and things have shifted. We have uh, those campers are definitely still coming, um, but we now have a number of kids on the autism spectrum as well um, and across the spectrum. So from the uh, mildly affected to the more profoundly affected kids. And per week, we have 16 campers a week. Uh, usually six to eight of those are full-time wheelchair users who need help with all aspects of personal care. And then uh, the remainder of the campers are ambulatory. Um, we have per week uh, two to three with exceptional behavior needs. Um, and we are able to provide uh, an environment in which they feel safe 
we're able to get to know them, find out what the triggers are, and uh, start with their strengths and, and build on that. So families pay a registration fee of $120. Uh, the Manitoba government uh, provides funding for one-to-one -one camper support. And so this is what allows us to um, use the summer day camp period as a time of intensive training for our staff because we have the luxury of that one-to-one -one camper support funding. And then the remainder of the funding is provided by our foundation. And so they fund uh, five staff positions, two of which are, actually three of which are um, OT physio positions uh, and then a couple of senior staff. And so we are available to provide ongoing training and mentoring and assistance in setting up environments for those uh, campers with exceptional challenges. So moving into the school year, the RBC Therapeutic Recreation Wellness Program, uh, we have a number of things that we run now. In 2008, uh, we kicked off our first program, which was um, preschool music therapy. And then the next year, we added an art and music program for teenagers and things that just sort of exploded from there. Uh, so we run a Saturday Night for Teens program, and there's more information about all of these in your handout. Uh, I won't go into detail about them. Music therapy, spa, explore, which are community outings, lots of cooking programs, yoga, and we have a number of family programs, uh, so fall and spring festivals. And our fall festival this past year, which is like a giant Halloween party, I think we had 135 people come. So it was a really fabulous time for families to have fun and network. Um, in the spring, we do we bring out all of our adapted bikes, and families can come and do a test drive, have, have an assessment by a physiotherapist, um, and then we give them information on, on the best bike to borrow or to apply for funding for, and they take that to their community therapist. Sunday afternoon swim days, family bowling events, uh, family gardening programs, and family cooking. Uh, so the staffing, we already talked about. Um, I work as the coordinator and attend a lot of the programs as well. And then our supervisors um, are uh, physio and OT. We have had a, a few staff members uh, in a rec therapy position, and they're usually uh, kinesiology or recreation management grads who have uh, worked in our summer day camp and, and received the training. And then our recreation support workers are primarily university students. Okay, I'm going to move into value and then take questions after that. Um, so what's in it? Well, there's a lot in it for the kids, the youth, families, and the staff. Uh, for the kids and the youth, um, it provides opportunities for fun in a safe environment. And uh, the safety is extends far past the physical safety. Um, we provide an emotionally safe environment where they, they know that they are cared for, uh, that they will not be forced to do things, um, and where they'll have opportunities just to step slightly outside of their uh, kind of comfort zone and take risks that are manageable and doable for them. And so there's some excerpts here from a letter that a, a mom wrote um, about her son attending our programs. And he is medically a very fragile boy. And so it was a really frightening for, for this family to um, 
drop him off and have him participate in our programs. So for Brandon, it means being with peers in a safe environment that cares for all his medical issues and allows him to have fun and experience activities his family can't do with him. We never imagined Brandon ever being in a sailboat or bowling in his wheelchair or crafting or just being with such highly skilled people who are doing this job because it is where their hearts are. For our family, it gives us the peace of mind that he's in a safe and entertaining environment which is different than if he didn't have such special needs. Uh, and for the staff, um, the training and benefits are also fairly extensive. Uh, each summer before camp starts, there are two to three days of staff training, which includes the physical handling things, uh, use of adapted equipment, and uh, more importantly, and I think part of what uh, makes our program unique, is training in the guided participation model and non-directive communication. And uh, by non-directive communication, we're talking about um, rather than saying to somebody, uh, put your jacket on, we're going outside, we look out the window and say, oh my goodness, it it's, looks a bit chilly. It's time to go outside. I'm going to get my jacket. I don't want to be too cold. And so... By doing that, offering an opportunity for that teenager then to think through what you've said and make their own decision. Um, and if they don't go for their jacket, then you would offer a few more um, bits of information to allow them to make that little thinking step and make make their own decision about that. And so we we do extensive training with our staff on how to set up those kinds of uh, environments. Um, and so the staff, because we have a, a high staff to camper ratio, they are able to uh, really work on forming um, really good relationships with the campers and uh, developing competence in the guided participation, non-directive communication, uh, strategies and then in September when the, all of the staff is funded through our foundation then we move to a lower ratio of one staff person uh, for three participants and for participants who need one-to-one uh, -one supervision uh, parents have the option of either sending their own support worker or we will supply a worker for them and um, a payment is arranged directly between parent and staff person. So the staff learn physical handling skills, they learn about health management, they learn communication skills, relationship skills, they have opportunities for leadership development, friendship with each other and with campers, and skill transfer into other work and home environments. So we do have a lot of OT and physio students who are with us as staff, but we also have education students, uh, nursing students, med medical students, dental students, um, and it's been really exciting to see these people uh, head off into their professional careers with all of these skills in their pockets. Um, the world needs more people who know how to interact with those who are navigating life differently. All right. Any questions or comments up to this point? Um, yeah. Uh, from uh, Robin. So since you do not have TRs on your staff, are the participants' goals focused on OT or PT outcomes? Uh, not... It's, it's a good question, and this, this is an area that um, we're working on is, is to get more concrete on actual setting of goals. Um, but I would say that we do our goal setting based on the F words. Uh, what, what do you need in order to have fun? What do you need in order to have friends? Um, 
and then we look at the um, zone of proximal development, which is what can you do now, what can you do with a little bit of support, and we'll set up a goal around that. So it might be a social goal, it might be a physical goal, um, but those goals are, and we get our um, recreation assistance involved in setting those goals, and then, uh, of course, uh, in collaboration with the physio and OT. Great. Um, so in your um, in your summer camps, you have one to one uh, ratio. Um, but how many kids are in the camp, like in, in a camp, on any given week? I'm assuming 16. that that's four or sixteen. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there's one camp that is based at a high school. And that camp uh, starts the same every morning. So uh, swim weeks, we start at the pool every morning and we swim every morning. Music weeks, we start with music therapy every morning. And uh, that was done to provide uh, predictability for those kids who have trouble with um, really dynamic and shifting environments. And then we can introduce uh, more change in different activities through the day. And so that camp, there are 16 campers per week. And then the community-based camp um, is 10 to 12 campers per week. Okay, great. So uh, there's no further questions at the moment, so. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move into challenges. And of course, there's always challenges. Um, our after-school cooking clubs, uh, we ran into challenges of uh, food labs in the high schools, um, things not being put back in the right place, um, food lab not being organized the same as it was. So we, we actually purchased four, put together four uh, cooking club kits. So. Um, four or five Rubbermaid bins with dishes, pots and pans, all the supplies that you need so that we don't have to disturb um, the setup of the food labs and the schools. How do we transport all of that stuff? Well, we found wheels. And so this yellow and black uh, cart, the handle comes out so it's easy enough to throw in the car along with all of your stuff and we uh, if we're running a club in a school for, say, a six to eight week period, uh, oftentimes the school is able to store the bins for us uh, during that time. And after we finish the dinner prep and eating in the foods lab, then we'll put everything back on the cart and uh, put it in storage till the next week. Uh, pools and changing facilities. Um, we do have a pool in Winnipeg that's been beautifully modified. It has uh, ceiling track lifts, it has water wheelchairs, it has a ramped entry, uh, but the change tables are not adequate for um, adolescents, teenagers, young adults, and so we ended up purchasing an extra wide massage table that uh, we bring to the pool and then we use the mechanical lift and that's been great. Um, client transportation at camp uh, continues to be a challenge um, and we have used accessible wheelchair taxis, we have uh, rented buses, um, but the uh, Resources are relatively limited in this area, and so that continues to be a frustration. Probably the best thing that we have done is uh, chosen and set out our um, camp activities in such a way that we can walk, bike um, between locations. And we have umbrellas, we have spray bottles for the really hot days. Um, and this past summer, that actually worked out fairly well. Uh, equipment storage, always an issue. Um, and we moved into a new center here in Winnipeg uh, in May. And so we are still working out the bugs of storage. 
uh, but we're getting there, uh, looking at uh, vertical storage of our large equipment. Uh, school permits, um, and that's something that we have to get for after school programs. Um, getting payment for one-to-one -one support from some of the smaller agencies supporting kids uh, can be a challenge. Um, and then, of course, uh, provincial health or privacy legislation um, puts up roadblocks sometimes for us to uh, communicate with kids and families. So where do we go from here? Well, we, um, we want to, we've started to incorporate some of our program graduates in as volunteers, and we want to look at um, providing some more structure for that. Uh, as young adults, they often enter kind of a vacuum of services. Um, we want to move to more structured parent training programs, and we uh, actually did a pilot this fall uh, that was a combination of parent-only sessions, training them in um, guided participation, non-directive communication, and then having sessions when they would come and cook with their child uh, and practice specific techniques. So that's uh, something that we want to expand on. Uh, we want to partner with other day camps for staff training so that um, there are more uh, places where the youth with significant behavior issues can have a successful uh, time in summer day camp and then partnering with other organizations as well for pre-employment and volunteering. Any questions or comments? I just have uh, one question uh, now. Uh, what are the qualifications of the recreation assistants? Um, for the recreation assistants, uh, they have to be at least in grade 11 um, and basically be interested uh, in this kind of work. For somebody with no experience, uh, we, do, we interview for our summer positions in March and then um, they go through the training process uh, before the summer day camps start and then throughout the period of summer day camp training. And um, so they have to have, they have to be at least in grade 11 uh, and, and then we require the usual criminal record check, uh, child abuse registry checks. Um, a lot of these people are heading into the helping professions of some sort. Great. Uh, just uh, one more. We'll take this one last question here. Uh, are the recreation specialists on staff um, CTRS? Is this a requirement? Thanks. And this is a great webinar. I think that you, yeah, they're not certified uh, recreation therapists? No. And I'm not sure that Manitoba even has a certification process for rec therapists. Um, Ontario's uh, system for recreation therapy is much more developed than Manitoba's is. As far as I know, uh, Manitoba does not have a certification process. Great. And if I'm wrong about that, I would love to know more. Um, and my email is up there. Um, I'd love to uh, have comments from people. And actually, anyone who submitted questions, I, I would love to hear from you, period. So please right. send me an email. All right, so yes, uh, Carol's email is up on the screen. And uh, we will be posting the, the presentation and um, all of the handouts for everybody as well. So you'll get a, a notification about that very soon. So I just want to thank you, Carol. This is an amazing program. You're doing some great work and I think really inspirational to, to everybody online here. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that.
Um, so we'll just uh, close off now. We're at the top of the hour, so just want to remind everybody that we do our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and it's always great if you can watch live, as all, as we've just seen, all the questions and comments can really enrich the discussion. But if you can't watch, like I said, um, the recordings will be uh, posted and made available online after the presentation. So on December 14th, we're going to hear from CJ Curran and uh, Dolly Menadak from Holland Blurview, and they're going to talk about the importance of peer-to-peer -peer connection for the children and youth that the hospital serves. The youth engagement strategy provides the structure to engage with youth leaders as partners and provides access for the hospital community to train youth mentors. So, and we're also in the uh, process of compiling our best of uh, for 2016. So in the next couple of weeks, we'll share what some of the most popular topics of the year were as we head into our Christmas break. So as always, uh, some really interesting and exciting uh, presentations coming up. And thanks for joining us today. And we hope to see you back here next week. Thank you for the opportunity. You're very welcome.